I'm happy that Harish Dua ji also is part of this entire discussion. A person who has been sitting around on making, you will be surprised. Today I was back to Hyderabad and this is the material which I have received. Can you just imagine this is, I don't know whether you are able to read, Compendium of Forensic Accounting and Investigation Standards. So just imagine so much of coincidence that I received my committee material today. My chairman agrees he was not there and now he comes and uh, talks to all of us. And then we are conducting the first uh, you know, uh, you know, webinar or a series uh, on forensic and investigation standards. It's all set of coincidence and that has also been launched on an international platform. This is how we are actually moving forward. This is where we are accepting our things. And friends, one thing, again, uh, with a folded hand request is the change which is going to come because of technology in the accounting profession, not as a chartered accountant in practice, I'm talking, but also as an industry member, you are going to face it totally differently. Whether it is industry, whether it is regulator, whether it is business, whether it is financial reporting requirement, whether it is going to be auditing requirements, which is going to be adopted, all is under going to go change. And everything when you talk about is going to be through system and cyber uh, security audits and forensic audits are the most crucial thing of the entire profession, whether you be in practice, whether you be in industry. So the fact goes very simple, whether we are with time or ahead of time, we are actually ahead of time to get forensic standards on the table. And today 16 standards is not a small number. And next meeting we are going to hold and complete the seven. And with that, we'll the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India will have its own publication of the forensic standards. We made it very pro, you know, progressive by ensuring that we do it proactively, reach out to the regulators, reach out to the uh, you know, government uh, bodies, we reach out to the industry, we reached out to the banking sector, everyone proactively before releasing those set of standards. They all have given their vetting and then only the standard has come out. So this is the kind of homework which has been done. And today to have this kind of information and knowledge on the table, is I think we all are really lucky. Let's take one pledge. Really, I am passionate about my profession. I, I know every one of us are passionate about our profession. But it is our hands which can actually take that, uh, you know, mashal in hand and make it more international and more, uh, you know, uh, 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 the vibration of our, uh, you know, institute has to go across. So my request to you all people is, let's create and ensure that this forensic course become an international certification course for all the people across the globe. And we can make it happen. I know we trust each other and we'll make it in a big way globally also. And uh, I can talk more, more and more, but I think I have my limitation of time. Let me not uh, take more uh, uh, you know, time on uh, discussing on this point, but might be sometime later. I'll surely make a point to come and uh, talk as a speaker rather than a keynote speaker. <laughs> keynote speaker has certain limitation to talk because I can only talk on the bullet points, not on specifics. But, uh, uh, you know, it is really a pride. And uh, Kala, thank you very much. I'm happy that before you lay your office, I could actually come to Singapore and uh, uh, give my uh, thoughts to the members across. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Daya. As you said, I think uh, being, uh, you all being at the hem of the face, it's, we don't have undoubtedly the ICA, you know, will keep raising this flag high. It's very sure. And you said we are all passionate about it and we launched this course. And uh, we are also, it's, it's a privilege and honor for us to see how both chair and vice chair having with us. And it's being getting launched on the international platform. Thank you for that. And now, uh, as we said, we will look for an another occasion to have you as a speaker. Okay, thank you so oh, much, Daya. Yeah, yeah. I'll just change a little bit. It is not a launch. Launch is launch is yet to come. So okay. just it's a beginning and a teaser, rather I can say, to start okay. with, and we'll take the feedbacks and uh, accordingly we'll move forward. Sure, sure. Okay, and uh, uh, thanks, Daya. Over to you, Pratima. Thank you, Kala. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Uh, your passion about uh, the, the course and the, what all ICI has to offer is really contagious. And uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us an overview of the current and the future initiatives of DAP. Uh, 
Kala, I think Mr. Arpinder Singh is not there, so I think we can move on uh, with our panel discussion. So we uh, we will uh, move on with our uh, next section of uh, panel discussion. Today we have with us uh, industry experts uh, who have decades of experience in uh, internal audit, so, sorry, uh, fraud risk. Pratima, sorry. Um, yeah, Arpinder is not able to join. There's some uh, issue. But I'm happy to, you know, give everyone an overview of what Arpinder was about to talk. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we'll move to the uh, panel. I, don't, I hope that's okay. Okay, sure. So you want to begin now, uh, Sakit? Yeah. Then I will introduce the panel afterwards. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so um, this section was supposed to be done by, by Arpinder, but I'm just filling in. Um, uh, so... I'm sure everyone, all our friends here who are chartered accountants uh, in Singapore, um, I, I think so we all are aware of what's happening in India, right? There is so much of news, there is so much of information today on WhatsApp groups and so on that keeps, keeps you know, getting circulated. Uh, so we know what is happening. But if you ask me, right, being a forensic professionals, uh, what are some of the key things that what are the key, what are the big mega trends that is happening in India when it comes to regulations, when it comes to compliance and so on? Uh, these are some of the headlines, you know, uh, and we have obviously hidden the names of the companies here. Uh, but but um, I would say generally from a regulation perspective, it looks like there is, there is a big cleanup which is happening. The cleanups are happening between uh, in the banking sector. So you see lot of lot of uh, you know write offs happening so so the government wants to start uh, from a clean slate rather than you know carry forwarding the the bad loans and so on that's a huge clean up uh, clean up happening there uh, if you see from uh, from an auditor client relationship uh, there is some sort of tension that is that is you know uh, it is there uh, many cases we have seen now that auditors are asking much more uh, and that's that's what the what the profession has taught us, right? Uh, uh, sometimes the auditors were you know uh, were not, not that open or not that um, strong in asking those tough questions with the companies and so on. Uh, but we see today that you know the auditor uh, is is becoming stronger, uh, and that is leading to some tension. And I know the institute has a redressal system and so on. Uh, but the right questions are being asked today. Um, there is a lot of responsibilities on the auditors on reporting fraud. Uh, the Companies Act uh, 2013 required auditor to do so, but uh, now there is a new requirement under CARO as well that um, all frauds needs to be reported uh, uh, by the by the auditor. Um, if you see, ICI again went ahead and defined uh, you know bribery and corruption uh, under the definition of fraud. Uh, which again is important because uh, once you start defining a bribery uh, element under fraud, it, it again gets more importance uh, in terms of reporting, in terms of uh, uh, visibility, in terms of monitoring and so on. Uh, in, India, what, in India, what we see is uh, there is so much of, uh, you know, uh, regulatory, uh, uh, inquiries which are which are going on right uh, and sometimes it looks like um, it is going overboard and it might also look in some cases if I can call the word draconian uh, but it's but but I think so it's it's in certain aspects is required so if you look at today um, you know um, the enforcement agencies um, going not necessarily after the companies uh, but they are also going after the individuals uh, so, and this is very similar to what is happening globally as well. So for those who understand um, globally, there was a, in the US, there was a memo, which is called the Yates memo. And primarily the memo, this was part in 2015, the memo said that, you know, okay, you're fining $5 billion to a company, but the people who had done the fraud or who had done, you know, uh, uh, money laundering, they were letting, they were letting, they were getting off easily. And that's where uh, 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 Senator uh, Yates, she introduced this, which is called the Yates Memo, which is primarily casting onus on the individuals. And that is what we see in India as well, that there is more and more, more uh, uh, following up with the people. So if you look at, you know, arresting of 
the CFOs, the internal auditors, the auditors, uh, the directors, the independent directors means a lot of times the independent directors as a function we have, we know that it's a, a, a it has been a very quiet function in, in most of the organization. But but since now that we we sit on uh, we we present in a lot of boards, we see that the internal auditors are also sorry the the independent uh, directors are also asking the right questions right they are not not just a mere spectator which in most companies we saw that was happening um so so again there is more knowledge i would say to to uh, within the internal uh, the independent directors uh, they understand about about forensics they understand about fraud so today if you go uh, and someone is presenting that you know there was a fraud reported and we did X, Y, Z, we see that the directors and the independent directors asking management on what question or whether the, the investigation was complete, whether it was, with, you know, it, it was, it was um, uh, not partial, there was no bias and so on. So there are right, right questions being asked. Another thing which is happening in India is, is we see a lot of coordination between the agencies. So uh, earlier, you know, uh, if suppose the ED was doing something, uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs was doing something, the income tax was doing something, they were primarily working independently. But what we have seen is, is there is a lot of coordination between, between agencies. There is a lot of information which is, which is being shared uh, between the agencies. And remember, from a forensic perspective, uh, we work a lot with the CBI in India. Uh, uh, they are also upping their game in terms of uh, uh, knowledge, in terms of tools, technologies. Uh, they are building up a, uh, they have a big lab uh, uh, when they do investigations. So all these are, these are some mega trends that we see in India when it comes to regulatory actions. Um, again, if you look at, you know, uh, Indian regulator, the SEBI getting, getting active as well and um, uh, I'm sure you know who are we talking about, but uh, now the big the big names are being fined and they are being called out uh, for insider trading. Insider trading uh, is one of the key key areas that at least uh, my India team works on very 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 frequently uh, on 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 our own or sometimes with the regulators. Um, related party continues to be a problem in India because a lot of times, you know, you have so many shell companies, you have so many layers, so it's very difficult to identify related parties. And we have seen most of the siphoning of funds that has happened, happens through the related party rule. So that, that is that is something which is an area. And I think so again, SEBI has recognized that and they are looking at um, uh, more disclosure and, and there are more penalties and there are more uh, regulations around that. Um, if you, I talked about the, the 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 new CARO requirements, right? That auditors are required to report on Benami transaction defaults, all the whistleblower complaints that comes through. What has the company done done for those complaints and so on? Um, I talked about um, um, you know agencies agencies taking stringent action and visible actions, right? Again, the intention is to to uh, uh, to pass on the right message and to have a clear tone on the top. Um, we all about, we all heard about, uh, you know, uh, millions of uh, accounts being uh, disabled or, uh, you know, fake accounts that was created being disabled, disabled by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, a few months back. And that continues to, to, to happen today as well. Uh, that there are, there is engine that is running behind to identify which are these shell companies, dummy companies, Benami com companies, which are being floated just for the, uh, you know, purposes of, of either siphoning off or, or for, uh, you know, fraudulent purposes. And the last one, like, like we say, there is a clear acti activism between both by the independent directors and the shareholders. They are asking the right questions. Shareholders are ask asking the right questions um, in terms of uh, uh, corporate governance and in terms of ethics, compliance, and so on with the company. So again, when when people are asking, you know, you always get get more prepared, and you you start probably doing things, you know, uh, rightly, uh, or at least you're more cautious in terms of how you're doing things rather than you know doing it blatantly. Uh, there is clear advantage to companies um, and most and most companies we see or, or, or we work with, we see that, you know, they are going for self-declaration. And again, it is in line with, with global 
protocols as well that if you go and self declare rather than the regulator coming to you it does help the company right it, uh, in terms of if there is a fraud reported or if there is a, a compliance uh, issue and so on uh, it it helps company so self reporting self declaration is something which is happening more and more the companies act you know uh, uh, also requires this there is a vigil mechanism uh, you know requires companies to have a, a, a effective whistle blowing mechanism there is direct responsibilities and like i said there is more encouragement by the indian regulators um, uh, also um, uh, to come forward we heard we heard a uh, you know a couple of months back gagan talking about the the income disclosure scheme right um, in one of our our conferences again the whole thing is self disclosure uh, rather than um, the government coming uh, after you so what are some of the leading organizations currently doing in india right um, technology is becoming a, a factor most of the companies are now investing into technology which can which can help identify fraud proactively it is not just necessarily a reactive approach but is more proactive approach of how technology through advanced data analytics can be helped to identify uh, you know fraud fraud and siphoning off and, uh, of money and so on a um, lot of companies a lot of large listed companies that we have worked with we have seen used to have a one off you know uh, like a project right they call it the project on 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 fraud control but now we are seeing that um, companies are investing time and it's very similar to what's happening in singapore today in singapore when i work singapore government companies um, today are investing a lot on having a robust anti fraud framework most of the companies you will be surprised in singapore um, you know did not have a have a framework and this specifically happened after capel case you know a couple of years back when capel was fined uh, for for bribery um, uh, bribery right um, and they were fined 400 or million dollars and that was a big setback for for singapore similar to singapore investing in in companies on having a effective fraud risk management framework we see now in india as well that companies are actually going forward and and doing that um the fraud landscape keeps changing so it's not again a one off project that you do something and then you stop and that is where where a continuous uh periodic risk risk assessment on critical processes on high risk processes is something that is required uh, to be done uh, the last one i i i i think so uh, mr daya talked about it mr manu talked about it that um, cyber data protection data, data privacy is 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 key and i'm going to talk um, in the panel as well um, uh, this is one area where we see more and more cases coming in and it's not going to reduce so what are companies doing they are strengthening their entire programs uh, on data protection on privacy and so on um yeah so th that that's a quick you know 10 minute in terms of what's happening in india obviously i have, i could not have probably done the job that arpinder could have done uh, but i hope this helps yeah thank you saket uh, members uh, would you know mr arpinder had to leave because he had some other engagements but thank you very much saket for giving us a quick overview of uh, what is happening in india uh, from the investigation landscape uh, before we move on to the panel discussion i would like to in invite mr harish duwa uh, to tell us more about the new standards uh, with respect to forensic accounting a quick intro about uh, mr harish duwa Uh, he has over 38 years of experience uh, in the area of uh, governance risk and compliance and he is an advisor uh, for the forensic accounting and investigation standards with dab icai uh, so uh, mr harish duwa welcome and over to you uh, please uh, let us uh, have some more inputs on the standards and uh, you may just uh, take over now thank you mr duwa you are on mute yeah um good afternoon everyone yes great uh yeah actually uh, the good introduction has already been made because you know sorry mr duwa you are not very clear though i'm so sorry to interrupt uh hello is this better yes go ahead go ahead please okay okay so um already have got a good overview uh, because uh, singapore uh, 
by some means managed to get a coup of getting both the chairman and the, and the vice chairman of GAP uh, uh, to this uh, uh, platform. Uh, and you couldn't have gotten a better introduction to these standards and the effort that we put in in getting these standards out. So I won't uh, repeat much of that. Uh, what I will do is uh, certainly. Uh, I wish the voice is not clear. Maybe you can use that other internet which you use. Sorry to interrupt you. Mm, okay, hello. Is this better? Perfect, perfect. Much better, Harish. Thank you. Okay, okay. much better. I much guess. Better. Great, great. I think I'm also comfortable without these, uh, you know, paraphernalia over my head. Uh, so um, I will, um, first of all, actually, um, a lot of the credit goes to both these gentlemen. Uh, they have been instrumental in providing excellent leadership in getting these standards going and uh, getting them issued. Um, it has been, no doubt, uh, one of, the, uh, uh, you know, a, a monumental tasks. Uh, to achieve them in such a short time frame and and make them world class uh, in many ways uh, no other institute as you know uh, has these kind of uh, full set of standards and uh, not just uh, having 100 meetings or 65 experts on the team i think um, uh, more than the numbers uh, it was the quality of the discussions that really made uh, a big difference uh, <clears throat> so um, there were uh, very new concepts that we've introduced uh, things like um, applying hypotheses, uh, which um, a lot of our professionals do know about. They do apply them as well. But for the very first time, we actually uh, documented this in terms of how uh, we expect the professionals to uh, apply them in, in our real life engagements and things like that. Um, so without getting into much of detail, I think um, as you embark on your journey, of trying to read these standards and understand them better. Let me just give you two, three key main points. Number one, applicability. Uh, many of you may be thinking, well, maybe it doesn't apply to me uh, because uh, for example, you may be in the industry, not really practicing forensic accounting. One second. But let me tell you, as far as the applicability goes, uh, these standards apply to, uh, or rather are mandatory on all chartered accountants, whether you are practicing or whether you're in the industry. Uh, for example, if uh, you are um, um, a, a financial controller, CFO, or if you are, uh, for example, heading the internal audit um, a group of a company, they would apply to you. And um, they also apply to all situations where there is uh, basically uh, kind of assignments and these standards get into the details of um, you know what those terms mean um, so what my purpose in emphasizing this is that you may not be uh, sure if you are ever going to use them uh, but my submission is that please take the time to uh, take a look at uh, at a minimum, the first three overarching documents that are there, the preface, the um, framework, and the basic principles, and you will very quickly realize uh, to what extent you need to uh, use them. Uh, for example, currently, see the, uh, the, the mandatory nature, I want to maybe clarify that also a little bit. Um, you may be thinking that there are a lot of non-chartered accountants who actually conduct these kind of assignments. Uh, people primarily who have CFE, uh, kind of qualifications, for example. Uh, now, of course, the institute cannot mandate these standards on others who are non-members, uh, for example, the CFEs, but uh, there is a very highly likelihood that once the Indian government uh, realizes that uh, these standards are really having a big impact in terms of quality improvement, uh, they might go ahead and make them mandatory on all um, you know, uh, others as well. Uh, they might, uh, there is talk that it might possibly be in a phased manner. For example, listed companies get um, um, applied or maybe frauds over a certain amount is when they might get applied to you. So um, the other thing that I think is important to realize is that uh, at some point in time, if you are in the industry, you might need for a professional uh, to give you services in the nature of forensic accounting and investigations. For example, if you encounter a fraud in your uh, organization and you need external help uh, of a chartered accountant to come and investigate, 
uh, you should have uh, some sort of an overview of what is to be expected from these external professionals uh, so that uh, you are able to formulate the need, the requirement, the, uh, the uh, objective of the engagement in a more uh, efficient manner. And this is the kind of things that are covered in these standards. And uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that these are principle-based standards, meaning they really get into the, the outcome. They focus on the principles and what is the outcome to be expected of the professional conducting these assignments. They don't get into the how or uh, basically they don't spell out the manner in which you need to conduct these assignments. So um, as long as you're aware of that and uh, you um, recognize that the focus is principle based, you will find that they really um, give you a fairly good idea of what to expect. And uh, there is plan to issue guidance material uh, as soon as the remaining standards get issued, because that guidance material will get into the details of how some of these uh, standards are going should be implemented. Even though these standards have also um, gone a step ahead of and given certain um, indicative ideas, examples, even annexures in some places, listing down uh, the nature of the um, uh, you know the expectation for example there's a standard on uh, accepting an engagement and what we've done is provided an annexure that gives a idea of the kind of clauses that you ought to include in the engagement letter so there are a fair amount of what i would call guidance material in these standards as well mm, nevertheless uh, the real crux of the guidance material will be coming a little later in another month or so so just keep that in mind as you get into some of these standards. Um, those were more or less um, uh, the messages I wanted to make other than uh, the fact that they, we followed a very sta standard format. Each standard got uh, the introduction, the objectives, the requirement, uh, the uh, explanatory comments, and the um, uh, documentation requirements for the work procedures and so on and so on. The rigorous process that has been followed to issue them, uh, that has already been covered, so I won't get into that, but it included a 30-day exposure period so that um, uh, everybody had a chance to contribute, and many did. We got over 250-odd uh, inputs come in, including those from the regulatory uh, bodies as well, and uh, we were able to, you know, have a very extensive deliberation based on these inputs and thereby, uh, thereby um, introduce these standards, which I would say are nothing short of world-class. Uh, so that is my introduction I wanted to give overall. Uh, Pratimaji, you and Orsaket, uh, you may want to go ahead uh, with the panel discussion. Or yeah, if I, any uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Dua. I'll just uh, give a quick introduction because we have two more panelists with us. And uh, thank you for that introduction, Mr. Dua. It will be interesting to see how the standards would uh, impact the forensic accounting engagements once they are rolled out. So uh, we do have with us two more panels today. Uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Surat Mukherjee. Uh, he's the executive director of uh, internal, risk, uh, internal Audit and Risk Assurance with Dalmia Bharat Group. And uh, we also have Mr. Naval Bajaj, uh, head of uh, Corporate Audit and Assurance. Uh, Yokogawa India Limited. So gentlemen, welcome. And uh, the session will be moderated by our chapter member Saket. Sorry, Saket, I'm introducing you the last. Uh, I should have done that first. But uh, Saket is an associate partner with ENY's Forensic and Integrity Services practice in uh, Singapore. And uh, interestingly, Saket has also traveled to London on one of his investigations uh, to interview uh, an Indian fugitive. So hopefully we get to hear more about it, Saket. Over to you. Thank you, Pratima, and um, absolutely is okay. Uh, uh, all, everyone else is a guest. I'm, I'm a local member, so, uh, you know, hosts, they, they go last, so thank you. Um, so um, just just to ensure that um, Surat and um, uh, Naval, you both are there. Uh, let yeah, me yeah. start, yeah, let me start with, with you, right? Um, and Mr. Duwad, means he comes with so much of experience of making the standards. Um, when when uh, we do, you know, when we do investigations, um, there are 
sometimes we do our own investigation. Sometimes we get to read the reports of people who have done or other firms uh, who have done investigations, firms of all the sizes. Sometimes we have got, we get to see um, uh, internal investigation reports and so on. And, and um, we always see that there's a lot of inconsistencies in, in, in the approach, right? And the inconsistencies could be in terms of the scope, the period, if you're doing computer forensic, what are the type of keywords that needs to be adopted and so on, right? Um, how, do, how was the interview co uh, covered? Because when we talk to the clients, clients, there has to be always a balance that you don't want to go and boil the ocean. So if there's a fraud report, it doesn't mean that you boil the ocean and you spend three months on that. At the same time, it should not be something which looks like an inadequate coverage. Um, so tell me, when you do internal investigations yourself or you use external consultants like us, what are some of the challenges that you face today um, while doing investigations? Uh, is the question for me a second? Yeah, any one of you, Surat or uh, no, I, well, Surat, you can go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Saket, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my, uh, my appreciation to EY for hosting this platform and to ICI, Singapore chapter and uh, India for uh, really rolling out this wonderful uh, uh, set of framework which fortunately me and Naval both have contributed our minuscule contribution into this and we are very proud to do that. Uh, because this is, as you rightly said, Saket, when we do any, anything, when anything comes up, the, the magical thing around fraud is that uh, what surfaces is taken as the, uh, you know, kind of the tip of the iceberg. So whatever comes out, you, you start with that and then, you know, you never know where you are going to end up with. You know, you never know where is the chain or who do you land up with? So there are very, very serious, uh, uh, you know, uh, doubts in the very first instance as to when a fraud gets flagged off, uh, whether you go for an internal investigation or whether you, uh, you know, outsource it to somebody or you give it to an expert. So there is a primary bit of uh, investigation which is always done. And then if we feel that, okay, it's, it needs the work of an expert or, or it is becoming too big, uh, to handle, there's no other option, or they, it's it's too widespread. They need to do a lot of market analytics, market uh, the intelligence, and stuff like that, which obviously most internal teams uh, doesn't have the capability or the you know uh, the expertise to do it. So that is typically outsourced. What the standard has done uh, to us is that it has given uh, given all the entities, whosoever is doing it, internal, external, a nice set of framework. Uh, within which to work around. So at least you can tick all the corners or because it is principle based and the, the detailed things are yet to come out, but still you have a you know bit of a framework to work within and uh, try and see that you have, have all the corners covered. So earlier, like as you rightly pointed out, somebody will go in a one direction, somebody go to another direction, somebody will go to 50 meters depth, somebody will go to 100 meters depth and everything was okay. But now at least you have a you know, a guidelines uh, around which you can uh, work. And uh, at the same time, if if the those reports are subject to further scrutiny, you at least have a framework to uh, benchmark it against and say, right, based on this, we did a uh, uh, investigation or based on that, uh, we didn't do this. Perfect. Yeah, what do you say? And, and before, Naval, you come in, uh, anything new, but if there are any questions for the panel, please type it on the chat box. Um, Naval, anything from your side? Yeah, thanks, uh, Saket. Uh, first of all, uh, my congratulations to ICA Singapore, to you, uh, uh, DAP Chairman, Mr. Manu Agarwal, uh, Vice Chairman Dayaninga Sharma Ji, Advisor Harish Ji, uh, you know, Surat Mukherjee, sir, uh, and also to the Singapore team, uh, 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 you know, entire team, and I, I saw some uh, some people have joined from Bangkok chapter as well. So very happy to contribute my bit uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, knowledge series. Um, now, before I come to the, you know, specific questions about the top challenges uh, currently faced while performing an investigation, um, I would say this is the third session I am uh, in part of uh, being discussed on FAIS and uh, very happy to contribute. And in fact, this question has been asked in most of the forums. 
so um, i would like to just you know uh, take the discussion forward based on what surat mentioned and link it up with the fais uh, so uh, you know if i take the liberty of uh, you know answering uh, uh, sharing four challenges rather than three the first and foremost being the head of corporate audit of a multinational corporation um either i first of all i have to decide whether this investigation or forensic accounting uh, assignment has to be done internally or i have to outsource it so uh, that that is the first challenge evaluating the capability or the capacity or the maturity of the service provider or the internal resource because you know the as um, everyone would agree uh, there is very less time in this kind of work there is a fire which which has to be doused and management is Uh, very keen in and uh, you know uh, knowing the results very very quickly and there are no second chances available to you it's not that you do something today and then you can go back and refer to that some uh, you know again because it's a very sensitive issue and thirdly there is a legal stuff involved it's all uh, you know legal uh, everything has a, a legal dimension to it whatever you're doing so this is the first challenge the second challenge is ensuring that work is completed within the reasonable timeline and the reasonable timeline perception is different to different people management has its own you know perception of reasonable timeline maybe 2 days 3 days investigation team may say you know average acfe survey says that average there are 3 months uh, that are taken in completing an assignment and then thirdly there are audits or the people who are operating in the entire uh, engagement they have their own uh, you know perception of the timeline this is the second challenge the third challenge is whether there is a reasonable hypothesis that is available uh, you know how to proceed in this particular scenario whatever has been thrown to the uh, the forensic accounting investigation team and uh, lastly but not least finding evidence or facts about especially about the individuals who might have already left the organization i am happy to share that based on my interpretation of these standards i think the fais standards will help in resolving all those these challenges and they give a way how to resolve uh, these situations and they they are setting some principles based on which you can actually deal with this these practical situations uh, saket excellent thank you uh, mr duwa coming to you you talked about these standards being world class uh, and uh, we heard mr manu and mr dayat talk about that you know this is the first Uh, india is the first country to actually have a standard like this uh but but when i was doing my own research right um means i came across uh that the american institute uh, has has certain guidance it's not a standard but they have a guidance on uh, on forensic and uh, uh on forensics uh the association of certified fraud examiner uh, uh they have they have uh, uh, again um um i would say sort of a guidance note on planning and conducting a flow fraud investigations canada has something so the question is is how do you today mr duwat said he see that this standard how does it complement with the other global uh, standards practices that might be there uh, what sort of inputs were taken from those standards if any um, before the, 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 these were rolled out uh, yeah uh, saket uh... a question uh, many times people um, start wondering whether uh, you are making tall claims about uh, being first in the world and all that uh, let me just clarify two three things number one uh, the institutes that you mentioned the aicpa in the usa uh, the uh, english in, uh, england and wales australia also has and canadians yes they do well they what they have is as part of their regular accounting standards or auditing standards they have these um, one or ma- maximum two uh, short documents which they call forensic accounting standard or something uh, and what they try to cover it is like a peripheral subject matter kind of a specialized area and not um, actually um, none of them including the cfe Uh, the cfe has uh, their own bylaws and things like that in which they do it's like a four page document um uh, they do um uh, have certain you know m- 
they call it guidelines as far as i remember uh, but you know what we have done is we actually have taken this as a uh, a domain in its own uh, and really uh, put together a full set of standards from beginning to end so to speak and by the time we get done 16 are already there in the form of the compendium that i've shared a link uh, then uh, there are seven more coming uh, which will complement those 16 and they will include some of the other critical ones that are still pending like communicating with share uh, stock uh, share um, uh, sorry stakeholders uh, reporting the results uh, testifying before competent authorities um, applying data analysis including and then uh, evidence discovery in a digital domain um, so uh, you know loans and borrowings and also uh, related parties and connected parties so these are some very heavy hitting uh, specialized areas that has been discussed threadbare by the um, the committees the dab and the study group and all and there has been specialized team for each one of them and they've gone into the depths of uh, you know identifying the issues in those areas and how uh, one ought to expect the professional to conduct their uh, uh, engagements and assignments in these areas. So no other institute has anything as comprehensive as what we have put together. And um, this is going to be, like I said earlier, going to be supported by a lot of guidance notes, which has already started. Uh, we're going to have an implementation guide that will go into each one of the standards and talk about the uh, details of how one would conduct the assignments, for example, if we're talking about planning, uh, while the standard that you have in front of you will has given broad expectations of the professional as to what he ought to do when he's planning, uh, the guidance notes will get into details of having a full checklist and um, you know uh, procedures on what are the kind of things that you would get into when you're doing the planning exercise. So that is the comprehensive nature which makes us, I must say, stand out, stand apart from the other uh, institutes in, in many ways. I hope I answered your question. Absolutely. Coming back to the you know people on the other side, uh, Naval and Surat, uh, uh, means when I reach out to you, you know, it was a conscious decision of reaching out to Surat, who is a who, who does investigation, a hardcore internal auditor for many years with the Indian group Dalmia. Uh, and Naval, you you have you know worked primarily with large global MNCs. Um, uh, currently with Yokogawa, uh, you were with Honda Cars, uh, so Japanese companies, right? Um, tell me, these standards have been there now for the last few months. Have you taken any initiatives to discuss about these standards internally within your organization, Naval, you with your headquarters? Because a lot of the approaches on investigation I have seen is pushed, at least from global companies, from the headquarters. Um, Surat, the same thing about you. What sort of initiatives, what sort of discussions are you both doing internally, right? Uh, yeah. Naval, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, I can share that. I have uh, definitely shared this with my counterparts uh, in uh, Japan, and uh, they are very interested by the principle-based standards. Um, and uh, I must also say that uh, it's a bit of, um, I feel that it's a you know part of our uh, responsibility being chartered accountants to advocate uh, any initiative which is the first of its kind uh, globally, as uh, everyone has mentioned so far, to uh, educate. And I think, uh, as they say, you know, uh, there is a dharma rakshati rakshita. So what is dharma? Dharma is what you are ought to follow. So uh, standards are nothing but the dharma of the charter accountants. If we follow them, they, they are going to, uh, you know, safeguard us. That is how I see it. And uh, uh, you know you are able to explain the expectations which they should have from you. You are also uh, able to explain those expectations easily to other stakeholders who are actually doing the job, or if you, you yourself are doing the job. And then uh, you know if you are able to follow those standards, uh, then tomorrow if there are any questions later on, you are able to answer them. 
So, um, uh, as to answer your question, Saket, yes, discussions have happened and they are very interested. In fact, I am um, going to uh, have a presentation to all the our counterparts of the global, uh, you know, auditors forum within the company. Um, you know, go, uh, educating them about uh, what it talks about as part of the forum, and then let's see, you know, how it goes. Talking about India, uh, that is, uh, you know, up to my own office. So I am very clear about it that whenever I'm going to, uh, you know, get into these kind of assignments, I'm going to follow these standards. Surat? Yeah, from our side also, it is very similar because we are operating mostly out of, uh, you know, India. So we, uh, we have already discussed this and uh, we have uh, uh, shared uh, the documents and the Institute, uh, even when the draft, uh, was circulated for comments. I also at that point of time shared it with uh, the relevant CFOs and controllers to say that, okay, this is going to come, any inputs from your side. And uh, we are uh, obviously, you know, anything uh, now we are going to do uh, along with the team also, it needs to be done along, along, around this framework. And, uh, you know, because uh, obviously the directors will also, uh, once we present any such investigative report to them, would check against what standard, uh, you know, they have been done. And they would also like to have that uh, uh, kind of stamp on that particular thing. So as Namal said, you know, this is not an option or a choice, but this is something which we have to advocate and we have to, uh, you know, try working on it and, and keep seeing that. And because I'm sure as we have learned, our institute is very active and they would be continuously modifying this based on real life challenges, real life, uh, uh, you know, uh, inputs which will keep coming from uh, different uh, angles you know, the all the big firms the medium the small ones and the in-house teams and everything and uh, i'm sure in a span of time this will really become uh, you know much more workable much more grounded to the ground realities and uh, and uh, and we could only see an improvement once it is done once it is rolled out i don't see this going anywhere down but uh, there is only one way which is uh, uh, that improving and going up Okay, excellent. Uh, Mr. Duan, next one is actually a question from one of our, one of our delegates. Uh, Jayshree is asking, I, I, when I read the standard, it talks about that, uh, you know, a forensic auditor, I should just, you know, state fact and not give a conclusion. She says that, you know, RBI states to give a clear conclusion of, of whether there's a fraud or not. Uh, but uh, professional ethics and also the standard doesn't allow us to actually give a conclusion but it's only a fact based how how should someone handle such contradiction if there is something which is a requirement by rbi vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pro professional obligation you're on mute mr dua <laughs> I, I keep forgetting um sorry thanks for reminding me uh, yes i saw this question and uh, um it's an important point. Let me clarify by making a distinction between providing a conclusion and expressing an opinion. See, uh, these standards uh, do not preclude you from reaching a conclusion. In fact, uh, the, the standard on reporting results will be out, which will uh, get into the details of what we're discussing now. Uh, but yes, you may have already gleamed from what you read from the standards that have been issued that uh, the primary focus of uh, what we're advocating is that uh, uh, the accounting, the forensic accounting's work is primarily designed to gather evidence and report findings. Okay, now the facts should speak for themselves. The evidence should be compelling enough to allow the uh, reader to reach their own conclusions. Uh, but many times people need some help. Uh, so there's no harm in doing the analysis work in addition to gathering evidence to be able to reach a conclusion. And that is perfectly fine insofar as the standards are concerned. They do allow the professional to reach a conclusion. Now, that is as far as the, the uh, professional should go. The extra step of taking, reaching a conclusion and starting to express his own opinion in a written form is something that the standards do not allow. That is because 
there is a basic premise that you cannot have a situation where uh, it's like having the same you know judge jury and executioner concept uh, there is a conflict if the professional is conducting an audit and, or rather a, an assignment and reaches a, a conclusion that there is a high probability of a fraud and then says that this individual is a fraudster and therefore guilty is stepping uh, far too much into a judge's position so to speak so what the standards do is they say that as a professional uh, we uh, we should not uh, express an opinion of that nature where we are pronouncing somebody guilty or innocent and so when uh, uh, jeshri raised the question regarding uh, i think it was more regarding disclaimer uh, but we elaborated it slightly to include this concept so that we can clarify to what extent the professional can go uh, in so far as uh, providing the outcome of his work or her work and uh, the uh, clear mandate coming from the standard is that uh, we ought to avoid expressing an independent opinion uh, as far as disclaimers go there can be many number of disclaimers a uh, disclaimer could be that um, you have not been able to um, reach a conclusion uh, because for example there was not sufficient evidence to provide you with uh, the ability to reach a conclusion uh, there could be disclaimers around the lines of um, uh, scope limitations uh, there could be disclaimers along along many other things so the reporting results standard will clarify uh, what are those kind of instances where a disclaimer ought to be uh, issued uh, in fact there are many situations where uh, interim reports get issued based on preliminary work that is done uh, and then um, you know there is more information required to be able to conclude and many times you find especially in india especially in the area of uh, these banking frauds uh, where the professional may be working for the bank but the um, the borrower who uh, took the money uh, is very uncooperative and not uh, give doesn't give access to the information required or the books of account so many times there are those kind of limitations that uh, have to be reported uh in the uh, reports so sure. i could go on and on but i think i've yeah. answered the question sure i i'll take the other two question pratima pratima is asking uh that how would the block blockchain era impact forensic accounting i uh, my thought pratima is uh it's early adoption of blockchain uh looks like if the blockchain would be effective it would be adopted across it would be much more full proof uh, but at the same time it does does uh, raise more concerns around uh, you know risk of cyber crime and so on for example in singapore if you look at here right there is so much of trading that happens right um, trade finance is one of the critical areas here that companies have lines and so on so one of the risk that has is you know duplicate bls uh, that might be issued now through a blockchain concept that might be something which can be reduced but i would say that this is still early adoption there is a lot of challenges for the entire network to be on blockchain before this can be said okay the blockchain is helping reduction of fraud the other question from vishal didwania is how do you decide on the cost and fees for assignments generally uh, vishal simple question it is based on uh, the nature of fraud uh, and then is always something it could be a fixed fee or it could be like a time and material uh, hourly based uh, um, if you have some some matter i'll be happy to talk after this uh, uh, but but again uh, uh, it 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 depends on the nature of the allegation the size of the organization and so on just a last question to the panelists and please try to keep it short it's already 8 um, 828 here uh, uh, we talked about technology right um, means ransomware cyber threats uh, is one of the critical areas right in fact uh, singapore police force uh, uh, issued a, a report where they said that in the first half of 2020 vis a vis the first half of 2019 the amount of uh, e-commerce related uh, fraud social uh, media impersonation related fraud banking related fraud these are all, all become 10x uh, in the covid situation right um 
globally we see that uh, cyber crime is today costing 6 trillion dollars means it is the third largest economy after us and china as you see if you put that as a country uh, what is that uh, first of all mr duwa the question is how does the standard address cyber crime related issues if there are any any and the similar question to novel and surat is what is that you are doing in your organization to reduce the risk on cyber crime because that seems to be one of the key 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 areas which companies are have to look at and this will be the last question so keep it keep it brief please um yeah as far as cyber crime goes and as far as the stats go you have a student coming out on this digital discovery in the uh, digital domain and we go on to of course explain what do we mean by digital domain which of course includes cyber area i i think uh, the uh, there are specialized skills that are required which need to be uh, available or uh, accessible because this is not an area for any professional to just take up as a side business venture it's a very specialized area and some and you need to know what you're doing and uh, things like that and there's um, certain laws that are applicable and uh, that uh, is also an area that uh, needs to be known so you have this unique situation where you have to be a, let's say a, a very high tech person but at the same time have a, a decent grounding of what is the law tell you in so far as the limitations that you can uh, go to i mean you can't just break into somebody's email to collect evidence i mean you know there are limitations with regard to uh, legal pr- privacy of information and so on and so forth and uh, so it's a, it's a very highly complicated area and you have to be a bit of an expert in multiple areas multiple dimensions to be able to do your job properly and so um, you know uh, somebody who's very interested in knowing how to price your services i would say you may want to gravitate into that area and become specialized and you can just uh, you know ask uh, for you can demand the, <laughs> the fees that you would want to charge others in this area anyway i should not blabber uh, you ask sure. me sure so like, like like the news reporters novel that they do so you have 30 second before the ad breaks so novel 30 seconds <laughs> fair enough i'll have my go so the point is cyber security audits and you know other risks also you know one of those fai assign uh, you know engagements the standards are defining what is forensic accounting engagement what is investigation engagement and what what is legal support one key point is that audit word has been completely debarred from using uh, you know in this kind of engagements there are fraud indicators which are uh, which have been mentioned uh, there are st- uh, you know standard which are talking about with how you are you will prove something or uh, disprove something or not prove something and there there are standards on hypothesis all that will come in a combined way apply to the question that you asked in the situation i hope i meet yes surat so sakit from our side it is uh, it is user education 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 and education that's the only thing you know one is strengthening the back end of the it to make it a little difficult for those will do re- uh, regular uh, we have uh, set up a security operation center which uh, you know is uh, regularly 24 by 7 uh, you know monitoring the traffic uh, and also uh, getting to uh, see what attempts are being made and at the same time uh, trying to educate people what they need to do what they don't need to do and unless and until every user is uh, always aware Uh, it is very difficult because we are fighting a complete unknown soul and an uh, unknown enemy who has nothing to lose but uh, a lot of things to gain so it it is a joint war just like you know covid you know there is one virus and yeah. there is uh, this 8 billion people so it, it, we have to just put up your uh, best uh, posture and uh, then plain and simple be lucky absolutely absolutely like like they say you are as strong as your weakest link uh, and in cyber absolutely. that is very very important but i can just uh, you know uh, wrap up this that you know as a chartered accountant i feel proud that icai has taken this and we are the first bodies to body to do this um like like it was mentioned this is not only something which is which is for professionals uh, who are doing investigation or uh, forensic forensic accounting uh, it is applicable to each one of us even when we are in singapore we are part of you know uh, in many cases we are part of indian entities global entities 
how is that we can leverage on this and actually make this as a world standard a lot of times we have relied in past global standards and adopted that in them in india i would be very very you know happy if this is something that each one of us takes saying that india has this standard now can this be a world standard um, that other institutes start, start start adopting it does provide you know uh, consistency standardization uh, it provides provides the important today after the standard if 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 i see the you, you know my discussion with clients will be you know also easier because they would they would ask the right questions they they should ask me in terms of how an investigation needs to take place so i'm i'm again like i said i'm very very proud about uh, you know with with uh, what 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 icai india has done uh, with that uh, you know thanks thanks to to the panel mr dua uh, surat and navel uh, over to you pratima kala yeah thanks thanks saket uh, thanks to mr harish dua mr navel bajaj and mr uh, surat uh, mukherjee and now may i invite uh, mr somnath for the vote of thanks thank you thank you kala ma'am uh, i think i want to reiterate again that it was indeed a galaxy of speakers today i think that was one of the most engaging session uh, panel discussion we have heard in the recent past so thank you saket um, thank you mr navel thank you mr surat thank you mr harish we heard a balanced view from the regulators themselves from experts and from the industries and uh, you know industry users there's a lot of information a lot of information there so thank you we are indeed very proud saket i want to repeat your words also we are all proud of daab's work of icai that we are the country to start this uh, you know set of standards as a complete framework uh, let me thank the let me thank all the members today for supporting and attending today's event let me thank uh, mr manu agarwal chairman dab for uh, sparing his precious time and uh, speaking to our members today let me also thank uh, the keynote speaker for today ca dayanivas sharma i think his session was also uh, very engaging and interesting and we look forward to have you sir uh, for a full session um with that i would like to end today's session thank you all of you um looking for, looking forward to your support again and waiting for our next session thank you thank you so much thank you thank Thanks. you all thank you thank you bye thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.